Corinthians is famous for its 13th chapter. If you've been to a wedding, you've heard it recited. Um, but the deeper question is, how did Paul learn that God's love, his agape love, which is different from different types of love, is the greatest of them all? When we first meet the Apostle Paul in the Bible, he loves the law more than he loves God. And throughout his life, he has seen the damage. Everyone just whisper damage. He has seen the damage that his unchristlike way of loving has harmed himself, others, and to his amazement, even Jesus. Here's what I would be so bold as to say this morning. Every single one of us have a part of our lives where we have been wounded because we have been loved in a harmful way. Or there's been a lack of love. There's been a desire to see us better, but a pressure to change that is different from the way of Jesus. And Paul has seen this. And so one day, if you read about it, you can read it in the, in the scriptures where Paul meets Jesus. And I can only imagine his initial shock, genuine shock, when Jesus says, it's not only them, it's not only these Christians that you're persecuting, that you are using the law in a way that Jesus never did. It's not just these Christians that you're persecuting, you're persecuting me. And so when followers of Christ are treated and harmed by just ways of living and loving alongside of one another that are not lining up with who Jesus is, Jesus takes it personally. And I can imagine Paul's shock at that moment of discovering that you can memorize the entire Torah from beginning to end, which he had done. And you can know every dot of an I and every T of a cross, and you could try to live it out perfectly. But if you do that without love, you crush people. You, you, you beat them into the ground. You create in them the antithesis of the gospel, which is this belief that they will never be good enough. And this is what Paul was living in and getting celebrated for. And so to unwrap Corinthians' gift of love, we need to return to what something that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. We need to return to how Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And you need to go on this little journey with me because they may not seem like these dots connect. Like in order to love like Jesus, why are we gonna go back to the Lord's prayer? And there's a reason why. And there's a reason why when the apostle Paul meets Jesus, he goes through a period of deformation and then formation in God before he can be used by God. In Matthew chapter six, Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. And if you've gone to church at all in your life, it's called the Lord's Prayer. And it begins with our father, not your father. It begins from a place of intimacy. It begins, Jesus says, he didn't teach us to pray, you know, my father. It's no, no, it's our father, of course, positionally who is in heaven. And then it's hallowed be your name. That the first two things are beautiful that Jesus teaches us to pray. The closeness of God, but in the closeness of God, don't take God in a trite fashion. His name is to be hallowed. His name is to be above every other name. He is unlike anything else. And it's beautiful. So in Christ, he is approachable, but yet he is altogether holy. He is separate from. Give us our daily bread, which is what we need every single day, the provision that we need in every area of our lives. Forgive us as we forgive, which is grace. And lead us not into temptation because every single one of us lives in contested space and we have weaknesses. And he says, deliver us from evil. Jesus believes that there is good in the world and there is evil in the world. Jesus believed that there is a God in heaven and there is an enemy, an adversary who seeks to not only defeat but to destroy you. This is not just what Christians believe. This is what Christ believed. And he says, thine is the kingdom. In other words, that the, the Canada that we see is not the kingdom, that there is a kingdom that is greater than Canada. 
And this gives us hope because what is will not forever be because his kingdom is of no end. And so in teaching us to pray, Jesus showed us that if we desire to love others well, you and I need a place where we can talk to God, dot, 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 and God can talk to us. We need a place and the church needs a place where we can talk to God and where God can talk to us about himself, about ourselves, and about others. Here's what is, here's what I have discovered in my own journey. Here's what I think is a major issue in the church today in Canada. It is this, if we do not have a place of prayer, we work out in public what should be wrestled out in private. If you are living more reactionary, you need to cultivate a deeper place of prayer. If everything in the world annoys you, that may be a symptom of prayerlessness. And not from a place of do better, you're not enough, but for a a yearning to go deeper in God. I would say it this way, to love others well, we need God to fashion a well in us. And too many Christians have in their well, number one, they don't have a well, or number two, there's no water to draw from in the well. How many of you know that in life, you leak? You leak every day. And sometimes you go through something in life that draws a lot out of you. And so we need not just to be filled by the Holy Spirit, we need to be constantly filled by the Holy Spirit. I can tell in my friendships where I am not praying, I can tell in my marriage where I am not praying, by the Lord's grace, I can tell in my parenting when I am not praying, I can tell in my leadership when I am not praying. The less I pray, the more I think I can solve problems. And the more I pray, the more I trust God to solve problems. And this is Paul. You ever heard that expression, like if you have a hammer, everything's a nail? That was Paul. Everyone that he saw could be fixed by the law. But you know what the law shows us in all of us? We can't keep it. And nor could Paul. And so then we look at Jesus. And Jesus cultivated this private place of prayer with his father. And then from the outflow of abiding in his father's love, here's what Jesus had. He had the opposite of Paul. Jesus didn't persecute people to see them changed. He loved them. And out of being loved, they changed. He had love, Jesus did, even for his enemies. When he was wrong, he turned the other cheek. He gave freely to others. He forgave those who trespassed against him. And Jesus, even courageously, for those of you who struggle with people-pleasing, see this aspect in becoming formed more like Jesus. Jesus courageously let people walk away if what they wanted wasn't him. Each of the ways that Jesus loved. Please hear me with both ears and your whole heart today. If you can listen to the cry of our culture, it is a cry to be loved in a way that only Jesus loves. They are searching for it everywhere but Jesus, but it is a cry to be loved in a way that only Jesus loves. It is a cry for a society that looks like when Jesus is king, we just don't want Jesus to be king. But it is this ache and this cry in the Canadian culture in which we live. I am convinced if you stack Jesus' way of love against any other definition of love, it's not even close to which one is better. Yet all of this is obedience, all the ways in which Jesus lived and they come from a different source before an obedient step can be taken. How many of you have ever felt, and you need to be really honest here, I'll already put my hand up, I'll go first. How many of you have ever felt, I'm just too busy to pray? Can I see your hands please? Okay. Do you think Jesus wasn't busy? 
Could you imagine if you had, could you imagine how busy you would be if you had the power to heal a sick body? If you walked into the general hospital and you healed somebody and then you went to the next and you healed another? Not you, Christ through you. Understand what I'm saying? (laughs) Could you imagine the demand and the desperation? This is every town that Jesus went in. And yet it says over and over and over and again in the Gospels that Jesus snuck away to spend time with his father in prayer early in the morning and late at night. Why? Will you try discipling the 12 that he called? You don't wrestle that out in private, you're going to wrestle it out in public. You try being criticized every time you fulfill the law and the Pharisees beat you down. You try that. And you try experiencing the desperation of humans who have nowhere else to go and they hear that you may provide a solution. Jesus was busy, man. So busy he had nowhere to lay his head. Just busy. But he found a place of prayer. And from that place of prayer and from that place of filling, from that place of pouring his heart out to his father and then receiving from his father, from this place of prayer, Jesus publicly ministers. I've I've heard it said this. We go to school for three years to have a 30-year career. And Jesus was formed by his father for 30 years and had a three and a half year ministry. And the world has never forgotten about it. And some people even say like, well, for the first 30 years, he wasn't doing anything. Are you kidding me? Being formed by the father is powerful. This is Jesus. Jesus has been formed by the love of God. He has been formed by the Father and Paul has been formed by the law. And look at the contrast in how they love. Jesus said this in Matthew 7, verse 12. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. Tell the person beside you and say, yeah, that sounds easy. And here's, if you've been anywhere in this, here's what it can be in a relationship. Like, do unto others as you would wish them to have to do unto you. Here's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that in all relationships, you put up a scoreboard. And when you do something from love, you get a point. And when they do not do something from love, they don't get a point. And it doesn't mean that at some point in the relationship, you don't point and go, okay, this is a route. I am beating you like 57 to four, okay? You, you need to... Anybody in relationships ever do that? You don't physically bring a scoreboard. If you bring a scoreboard into your relationships, no matter which one, all I want you to know is you're on opposing teams because that's the only way scoreboards work. So it doesn't work that way. So this is not what he's saying. So whatever you wish that others would do, do also for them. And here's the hard part. Here's the hard part of love. You may do for others what you wish for them to do for you and they may still not do for you what you're doing for them. I said that with some passion, didn't I? (laughs) Maybe came from a place. (laughs) Don't try to say whom, just came from a place. I tend to only notice what I do and I fail to notice what others do for me. Oftentimes in relationship. Jesus says, this is the law and the prophets. This sums it up. And then he provides greater insight on how to live out his gold standard with others. You got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That's heart strong. You got to love your heart and it ends with strength. You got a heart strong. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. Turn the person beside you and just say, that's easy. I can do that. And so our love for God is to be all and it's to be exclusive. 
And then from being loved by God, we become more like Jesus, which we grow in loving others. And the church in Corinth is struggling to receive and therefore to give God's love. And so the guy who's writing the letter has experienced the failure of trying to change everyone through inferior means other than God. And we try to change others by our attitude. We try to change others by our mood. We try to change others by a million things, by control, by conformity, by rules. By the way, all good things, as was the law. The law was given by God, but it was not God. It was a created thing. It's still not creator. As I was reading my devotional this week, has anyone here ever seen something beautiful? Can I see your hands, please? Okay. Have you ever seen a scene, like have you ever just seen like the snow gently falling? It's a person beside you and says, that's not beautiful. (laughs) In the eye of the beholder, man. Have you ever seen something stunningly beautiful beautiful and been just taken back by its beauty? Like, have you ever seen a sunset that the colors in the sky take your breath away? This week, I saw something beautiful in person. I saw my beloved hockey team beat (laughs) another hockey team from a very close province to Ontario. It's beautiful. <laughs> when I see Lori disciplining the kids, it's beautiful. <laughs> Since then, I don't have to do it. It's wonderful. I love it. You go, girl. When you see something beautiful, something that takes your breath away, It is just this much beautiful in comparison to the one who created it. The next time your breath is taken away, I want you to pause and think, God, if this takes my breath away, how much more you who created this? How beautiful are you? And this is what Paul has experienced I've lived in an inferior way and I have now been loved in a way that I didn't deserve. And I have seen something beautiful that didn't come from me and it came from you. And his heart is moved. And the church in Corinth is struggling to receive and give give God's love. So they, they need a grander picture of something more beautiful than they have seen. And then they need to see that and then they need to see God. And so to help The church give gifts of love to others. Paul writes something inspired by the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12. He says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. However you were led, which I love. However you were led, I don't care. That's, you know, just however you were led, they were mute idols. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one is speaking in the spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Let's practice. I want everyone to look this way and I want you to say three words. I want you to say, I love you. you. Now you can say those three words, I love you. And then you can look at somebody and you can say, I love you. So Paul isn't just saying that someone can't just say Jesus is Lord. They can do that. What he is saying is, no, no, no. You can't say that Jesus is Lord if something else is. Yes? Love God with all of our heart is exclusive, even though we do it imperfectly. God, my love for you is exclusive. You are the beautiful one. I don't love beautiful things. I love you who is the definition of beauty, who creates beautiful things. And then from this place, I can say that Jesus, you are Lord. Therefore, my emotions are not Lord. My feelings are not Lord. My struggles are not Lord. They don't have the final say. They don't have the fullest say. And it also means that the people that I'm in relationship with aren't my Lord. So I can learn to love them as I am loved by God in a way that I don't deserve. And my life is full. Not easy. 
Paul is expressing something richer than the mere repetition of words. Spirit-filled and transformed followers of Jesus see Jesus as Lord. And this means the singular aim of their lives is to become more like Jesus. He is Lord. That means everything else just isn't. When you're in traffic, repeat it. The traffic is not Lord. It should not get the fullness of you. The driver who cuts you off is not Lord. They may be now in front of you, but they're not Lord. Love them. Not with showing a digit, but with a whole-handed blessing. <laughs> God is one God, but he is one God who exists, Jen Wilkins says, eternally in three distinct persons. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Each person is fully God, but the Father is not the Son, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father or the Son, but they are the triune God who is perfectly one and distinct in three persons. Where do we get the picture of loving one another well? We see it in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and how they love. Beth Felker Jones says, the language of persons is not perfect. It confuses people a bit. The oneness of God, or the Trinitarianness of God, is not the oneness of a distinct, self-contained individual. It's the unity of a community of persons who love each other and live together in perfect unity and harmony. And personal means, by definition, interpersonal. Not we're saying God is a person. That's not what we're saying interpersonal. And so God is love and God the Father out of his great love for us initiated his plan of salvation and God the Son accomplishes salvation from love for the Father and for us. And then God the Spirit applies that salvation from his great love for the Father and the Son and for love and for us. And everything you see in God is love who he is. And so Paul learns to be filled by and follow the Holy Spirit is to become more like Jesus. And then he writes in 1 Corinthians 12, and then we're going to get to 13. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but it's the same Spirit. And there's a variety of service, but it's the same Lord. And there's a variety of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them in everyone. To each, everyone say to each. You were given something the moment you gave your life to Jesus that is not for you. It is an expression of love for the people around you. And it's called the spiritual gift. It may give your life some definition and clarity and purpose, but it's not for you. It's for others. The church of Jesus Christ will only be healthy when every follower of Jesus uses and gives their spiritual gifts freely to others for the common good. It's the way the church was designed. And the church is more dysfunctional the less people utilize their spiritual gifts and the more they use their spiritual gifts for their own benefit and glory. And it's all over the church in Canada. And it ought not be. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews and Greeks, slaves and free, and those who are made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Just turn your head, look around, see everyone, there's many. That's, that's who he's talking about to the church in Corinth. God is one. God's church is one, but we're not all the same. We have different gifts, different ways to serve, different activities, different ethnicities, different genders, different skills. We're all in different seasons of life, but we're one body together called to love one another the way that God loves us. And we're not perfect. Turn the person beside you and say, that should not shock you. I always joke about it, but that should be the one word that every human being should retire from every relationship. If you're talking and you're in a fight with someone who's accusing you of something and you have the temptation to say, well, I'm not perfect. It's not new information. They already know that. <laughs> sort of saying, I'm not at home right now. If you're sitting in this room, we know that you're sitting in this room. We're not perfect. Our interpersonal relationships therefore require, here's what they require. Prayer and practice. Prayer and practice. Man, I'm telling you. Things go dramatically poor in my life when I see something and say something right away. I'm not the smartest man in the world. So I cannot afford to be giving too many more pieces of my mind away. Okay? 
I need every last cell. Many die every day, so I am told. But something profound happens when I see something and in private I pray something and I ask God what I'm to say. And here's what I found. What God wants me to say is never what I want to say. It doesn't always change what needs to be said, but the motivation of why I'm saying what I'm saying changes. And this is what Paul is speaking to the church in Corinth about. So he says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. How many of you have something that you have seen on earth that you want God to explain why it is this way? Can I see your hands, please? Me too. Paul says to the church in Corinth, if I have prophetic powers and I understand all mysteries, a mystery is why is this the way it is? That's a mystery. And he says, if I understand all of that and if I have all knowledge and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. Okay, Paul wrote this to the church in Corinth a long time ago. And I love how it says, if I had all knowledge. There's this beautiful new word and term called infobesity. Infobesity, which simply means I have all the information, but none of the character formation and action to follow. In the phone you have in your pocket, you have access to more information in your phone than Abraham had in his entire life. You do. And so Paul to the church in Corinth, like he couldn't even imagine it. And what he's basically saying is, you can have the fullness of knowledge, but is our world more loving? Here's the question. We have the internet. We have so much knowledge. Are we more loving? No, we are tearing each other apart at greater levels. Powerful. And if I have faith so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have and I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. And then he says this. Now we're at the wedding text. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. Oh, man. <laughs> It is not irritable or resentful. If I am getting coffee and they get it wrong, I'm irritable <laughs> over something meaningless. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love is the only thing that'll never end. It'll never fail. God's love. As for prophecies, they're gonna pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. And then he says these words. When I was a child, and he's not talking about being a kid. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, when I met Jesus, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. And so now faith and hope and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these, Paul says, is love. Why? Because he's lived his life believing the greatest is the law. And he's crushed himself and he's crushed others. And Jesus says, I take that personally. 
Paul knew what it was to love the law, but not the giver of the law. He met Jesus and learned how to follow Jesus, the gold standard. It's the better way to live. Is it any wonder why when helping to write a church struggling to give good gifts to one another, the Holy Spirit inspired him to say, the greatest of these is not the law. It's not diminishing it, but God's love. Remember, in teaching us to pray, Jesus showed us if we desire to love others well, we too need a place where God can speak to us about himself. He can speak to us about others. And he can speak to us about us. If we don't have a place of prayer, we will work out in public what should be wrestled in private to love others well. May you this week allow God to fashion a well in you. May he bless you and may he keep you.